And the first item of business, where are they at? Right. Yes. That's what Point I of said. information. Yep. I didn't want to bring this up while the, the group was here, but the um, START program is funded by a, a grant. Uh, and what was the amount of that grant uh, on an annual basis? Special Ed is not here. We'll get you that answer. Okay. We'll uh, send no, a text a to him right now. Matter, but just to put that in context. Where did our Detroit partners go? <laughs> <laughs> right. Should we do? Um, we can do our introductions. Do we have staff here? Okay. We already did that. Yeah. <laughs> then if you show up to meetings, you'd know where we're at. <laughs> uh, we didn't. Did we do state and federal? I missed I it completely. Like I missed yeah. it. We didn't do anything. We didn't have uh, any. He yeah. commented yes, and she commented. I was getting water. I mean, I know yeah. you guys are yeah. <laughs> I can't do. I have one public comment. That Who's here? I'm expecting some other people. No, I don't want to start that early. That gets us. I don't. Is this in trouble legally? I'm the one spoken in. Oh, yeah. This thing just did something and you wanted to, you know. <laughs> I lived on the East Coast too. Three years in Boston. Five years in New Jersey. I wanted to um, introduce myself and say hello. Hello, I'm sorry, our, we're two ships passing in the night. Yeah. Um, you know, I talked to Nancy Schwartz from the National Board, and she speaks very highly of you. She says she's known you for a long time. And she and I um, presented to Representative Price's committee, the House Education Committee, about National Board certification. Oh, you did? Just a couple of weeks ago. I love Amanda. And yeah, and, and so um, Nancy said to tell you hello. Well, back at it. And she said, hopefully, we can get together um, and meet with the governor's office at some point. Because um, I spoke with the governor back in oh, cool. March at the governor's um, Education and Economic Summit at DeVos Place in Grand Rapids. And I talked to him about um, national board certification. And he said it sounded like a great idea, this notion that um, you could merge this, this evaluation debate with uh, credentialing. And, and make oh goodness, and, and professional learning and make them more relevant one and more interrelated if you will um, and also hopefully begin to address this issue of equity and 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 helping retain teachers in um, thank you in the high needs areas where you know you have such churn of, of teacher turnover and so forth um, so he just cautioned against the use of the word national because of the backlash from Common Core. And, and so we, we tend to refer to it more as board certification instead of national board certification. But David was there. How are you, by the way? <laughs> Say hello. Um, David was at that meeting. And um, so we're really pleased that we're enjoying support from the MEA. And um, hopefully we'll be able to move the work forward in terms of elevating the profile of national board certification. So our plan is to hopefully present before the Senate Education Committee in the fall, because I spoke with Representative, or I should say Senator Pablo, and he, he would like us to come in the fall. Jean, did you but we obviously would like to, at this point, just kind of spread the word and educate people about what national board certification is and how the process works and the way that it can really impact um, the quality of, of, of teaching that happens in schools. Well, the gov Likes information. Yeah. Like I, well, I think Kyle did. He, well, is, uh, he reads his brief. At least that's what we're assuming right. Kyle's doing. Okay. <laughs> but he also likes. We could be wrong. That are what he calls he, he, he ran away. So. He's being asked to make a decision <laughs> right. or to give advice on what the next step is. Right? Don't expect or, the worst. So if you can weave the two together, yeah. we could do the information right. thing in a month. That's fine. And then say, here are three yeah. things we want to talk to you about. Yes. Get your guidance. Nothing. Yeah. Just we all got I done quick. Yeah. I know it's when I met with him, I'll, I'll give you what I gave the governor. Because every year the teacher of the year gets to meet for about 15 minutes or 20 minutes with the governor at this. You know, the, the, the March so summit. That always um, happens every month. Gosh, I should run for teacher of the year. Yeah. All right. Get some We're flexible. Time, right? 
So um, sometimes Nancy it runs is really long. happy that you are in this role because she knows that. You well, have I think a, that's a important, isn't it? Um, I thought customer service was and, most important. And, uh, and, 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 and honestly, I think you you have a good sense of what we can yes, do. People will sing in the to work forward in a meaningful way. Have you? Are, how familiar are you with national board certification? Yeah, the whole process? Okay. okay. If you may, I give you the oh, information. Yeah. Okay. It, it all begins oh, we are with these five time core propositions. We'll be lucky to down. And by and 10 o'clock at night, probably. This is, this is the work of, okay. of yeah. uh, pack of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And the certificates are based on uh, performance standards for teachers. So what teachers should know and be able to do in a variety of certificate areas, whether that's high school chemistry, whether that's uh, early childhood education, whether that's middle school um, math. There, there are a, a vast number of certificates that are tied to the, uh, the specific level of uh, and content. Is there a gradation? You're either certified or you're not. Right. Yeah, they were supposed to call the group back together and start it, but then they could yeah, add the to state it. Of Michigan, oh, so yeah. Michigan, and Let's we'll check the child. In the state of Michigan, there are three certificate areas. There's a provisional certificate, which is for, for people that are new to the profession for the first um, three years. You have a provisional certificate, and then if you have um, highly effective, effective or highly effective evaluations, then you are eligible to earn your professional certificate. So it goes provisional, then professional. And that's what most teachers have as a professional. Statewide grant. They have to earn a certain number of you in education credits in order to be certified as a TCA. And then the third level of certification is called the advanced certificate. Very few people are having you got a certificate because. All right, we are back. If you have an board certificate, then you have that Invite Lamar Lemons to come up and whoever's presenting with him. So. There are a number of other things that the National Board Certification is the presentation up there? It was. Uh, it was before lunch. We'll get the presentation put back up. So, so Dr. Zyla, you had asked a question on the START grant. It's about $1.5 million statewide is the grant. And about how many of these programs or, or such are funded through that $1.5 million? <laughs> we'll get that answer too. What, what do I hit to, to, to turn the page? All right, so the last item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda is a presentation by Detroit Public Schools Board of Education. We have set aside a half hour for this conversation, and as I said, I'd like to invite Lamar Lemons back to the board table. He is a member of the Detroit School Board. And Many of us have worked with him for a number of years, and uh, if the others would like to introduce themselves, we'd appreciate that. My name is Thomas Padroni, and I'm a professor of curriculum studies at Wayne State University, a teacher educator. And my name is Thomas Blakely, I'm an attorney, and I'm representing the children of the Detroit Public School System in some litigation. And our the table is yours. Okay. Um, well, the PowerPoint has started, and. Uh, actually, do you want um, us to back it up? No, I don't know. It, okay. it can go, and I think it's going at a good pace, and I can talk as it uh, continues on, and then you could look at it as uh, at your leisure. Um, and so, um, hey, we want to talk. Well, this uh, PowerPoint just gives the history as to how we got here, how the Detroit public schools got in the conditions condition that it is. What happened? over the last 17 years. And it started with Public Act 10 of 1999, uh, which uh, was a reform experiment that removed the uh, elected board and put in a reform experiment. So this was the first experimentation on the D Detroit public schools. From there, uh, they returned it with the district in deficit. And right before you see the Adamati report, which points out that the district was one of the uh, top districts in the state, uh, um, for what the top districts in the country for free and reduced lunch, over 100,000 students. Of course, it was the only district in the state with over 100,000 students. It was also one of the top uh, districts in the country for special education over the, uh, over 100,000 students, but more uh, 
more relevant to uh, contemporary matters, it was uh, we had the most uh, nationally certified teachers, nationally qualified teachers. And the legislation that is, uh, has just been signed, um, well, has, is about to be signed into law, will allow uncertified teachers. And, and to that point, we believe that is further uh, discriminatory and a further Jim Crowization of, of the district. And uh, Dr. Perdoni will talk more about that. Um, we want to uh, talk about, first of all, that we oppose this division of the school district into two districts. There's absolutely no reason to do that. You're not doing that to protect it from any debtors, any creditors. So why divide the district? That cost of about approximately $35 million could be mu much better spent on the children. Um, we oppose the utilization of the former DPS test scores. You're dividing the district into two. You're creating a new district, and then you're going to use the, the district, the, the DPS scores, uh, as, as a guise to, for, for the SRO, which, as you know, is no longer under your authority. And so it is not un no longer under, from our perspective, democratic rule or the rule and, and compliant with the Constitution. Um, this is an imposed bankruptcy without discovery. Had we went to bankruptcy in the federal court, discovery would have occurred and we could have had proportional allocation of responsibility. We know that the state has operated the district, so it is deciding the proportional allocation without, uh, without any input or, or any fairness uh, to it. And they're, they're deciding how much they're going to pay when, in essence, under Headley, they owe a lot more. Uh, at this point, I'll uh, turn it over to Dr. Bedoni. Well, and I think actually we'll have Tom Blake. Oh, Tom Blake. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd like to. Uh, my goal or my task in, in looking at this new uh, legislation has been to analyze it for the purpose of determining whether it's constitutional or unconstitutional. And I, I think there are two very serious constitutional issues with the with the legislation. Uh, first of all, it, it distinctly violates the Headley Amendment, which requires the, the state to compensate a local uh, entity whenever it orders it to do something. And now we, what we have is we have a, a system set up where the old school district is being saddled with nearly $3 billion, and that's a conservative estimate of debt, that they're to pay out of their 18 mil millage. Uh, the estimate is that it's going to take 25 years to do without any uh, assistance, particularly from the, from the uh, state in that regard. Uh, so that would be a, a Headley violation, which is part of our Constitution, Article 9, Section 29. Article 4, Section 29 of the same Constitution uh, addresses the issue of local acts. Uh, it's it's absolutely unconstitutional for the state to create a local act without doing three things. Passing it by two-thirds majority of each house and submitting it to the electors of the city. And as we all know, the, that was a midnight run that resulted in the, the, what they have come up with. Why it is a local act is that they use the clever rubric of qualifying local district. And if you substitute Detroit Public Schools for that rubric, you'll, you'll understand why it's a local act, because it's the only school district in the state that qualifies for consideration under that act. They define a local qualifying district as being a former first-class school. Uh, first class, by definition, is a population of 100,000 or more. Uh, there's only one school district that meets that requirement. They define first class school as now uh, with a population of students in excess of 40,000, a slight amendatory is what they call it to the act. There's only one school district in the state that can meet that. Uh, past challenges to the local act constitutional aspect have always been rejected because the 
issue of whether or not something, you know, like is there another school district that could eventually qualify? And we would say, yes, that, that's true. They could eventually qualify, but the purpose of this act and, and the date of this act becomes effective as of July 1st this year. So only one school district meets the definition of the act, and we think strongly that that's a violation of the local acts uh, section of the Constitution. And uh, I'm, I'm here to suggest that, that this board may be interested in joining us in a potential seeking of an injunction or alternatively filing an amicus brief on our behalf in support of this. And I, I'll, 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 I'll pass to Dr. Padroni in just a minute because in order to be successful in that in Denver, we have to have <laughs> irreparable injury that w must be demonstrated if, if the act is in fact unconstitutional, such as to justify injunctive relief. And uh, I'd, I'd like Dr. Padroni to address the, the irreparable harm that this act is likely to cause. Thank you, and thanks so much, Board, also for, and Superintendent, for <coughs> us allowing us to have this opportunity to speak with you. Um, I do want to speak to the issues of irreparable harm, and I'm a teacher educator and education. <clears throat> I'm a teacher educator and an educational researcher. Um, I've been studying metropolitan Detroit and specifically Detroit uh, schools and their context for over 10 years now. Um, I, I want to speak very briefly to two issues that I think will constitute irreparable harm and that this board should be deeply concerned about given its role. Um, one is the issue of um, unqualified teachers or non-certified teachers. Um, I want to speak to both why that can be so harmful and also why I think that that provision of the bill is unnecessary. Um, and I'll start with the former. Um, we heard about two years ago from um, then emergency manager Jack Martin that there was a severe teacher shortage in Detroit public schools and we continue to hear that today uh, of a number of approximately 170. Um, clearly at the level of the classroom that shortage does exist but we know in what constitutes a shortage or not there is a pipeline of teachers of applicants who are potentially entering a district and what became interesting to me about two years ago when Jack Martin declared this shortage was a very good colleague of mine um, Dr. Maria Ferreira who was then the director of the Woodrow Wilson fellowship program at Wayne State University which is a, a teacher pipeline of highly qualified teachers directly into Detroit public schools. My understanding is it was an agreement that was negotiated a number of years ago and that there are four partner universities who are specifically preparing high level candidates for entry into the Detroit public schools. Dr. Maria Ferreira marveled at the fact that none of her applicants, none, were being asked in for interviews. We can imagine that if there's a pile of interviews of, of applicants that the district might decide, well, even though Wayne State or Michigan State thinks that these folks are highly qualified, we don't like this one or we don't like this one. But none, none were coming through at the same time that the district was declaring a teacher shortage. I kind of let that go. It sort of backburnered until um, I met with, uh, on, on a panel at Wayne State University with <coughs> someone who is a, <coughs> she asked me to use her name, a high level central administrator <coughs> at DPS who works in the talent department. And she said, yes, indeed. <coughs> During the time of both emergency manager Darnell Early and before Jack Martin, there were, for infrastructural reasons or whatever, not having the capacity, the administrative capacity, there were a large number of teacher applications that were never even considered. They were left sitting there. Now, I'm sympathetic to the issues that might generate that lack of capacity in the district. Although, of course, we were hoping for those efficiencies that emergency managers would bring. Um, but nevertheless, it seems to me that a step that one takes if one is going to declare a teacher shortage is to identify exactly what the nature of that teacher shortage is. And a part of that would be to say, well, what is your pipeline of applicants, of potential teachers coming in? Um, I m have met with Judge Rhodes twice um, in the last three weeks. Um, in his office and I at the most recent meeting brought up this issue in particular with him I said look Detroit students deserve the same qualified teachers that everyone else gets 
you know, if, if there's a sincere teacher shortage, of course, we've got to get some warm bodies in there. And some of those warm bodies might even be decent, right? But we would want to make sure that there really is a need for it. This legislation is predicated on the belief that there is a need to circumvent current qualifications for teachers to fill those classrooms. So I spoke with uh, Judge Rhodes, and I said, Judge Rhodes, here is what Dr. Ferreira told me. Here is what your uh, administrator in your office told me. And he absolutely affirmed the same thing and said, yes, we are aware that there is a very large pool of applicants whose, interview, whose um, applications were never even considered. And he said, you know, I think it's because they didn't have the capacity. And I offered again, yes, but if, if the district is going to identify a severe teacher shortage, it seems like that should be part of the calculus. And he made a pledge at that time to us that he would not hire any non-certified teacher during his tenure and that um, it would be the decision of a future board, according to the legislation, whether they were uh, hire non-certified teachers. We know the kinds of financial pressures that school districts are under. It's not hard for me to imagine a situation where a school board with its best intentions says, you know, we are under such a financial crunch and hiring these non-certified teachers would be a significant cost savings and maybe it's something defensible to do. Af after all, the state legislature in considering these issues said that this was acceptable. And I'm here to tell you as a teacher educator that it's not acceptable. It's precisely our students in urban districts who need the most highly qualified teachers, the ones who have been prepared to teach in urban districts, who have been educated on the life conditions of students and the particular culturally relevant approaches that teachers need. We do know how to educate very competent, highly competent teachers to teach in those districts. There are so many incentives already against them, the way that teachers who struggle in Detroit schools are oftentimes labeled as failures because of the performance on the exams, um, the much more difficult teacher condi teaching conditions, the lack of supplies oftentimes, the poor building conditions, the large class sizes. There are so many disincentives that when we have these high quality candidates who are specifically prepared and who want to teach in Detroit and are never getting an interview. And then we declare a teacher shortage so that we can get um, non-certified teachers in the classroom. This is highly problematic, okay? Uh, I, I know that my time is, is up, so I'm gonna mention one last thing. The bill also includes in it punitive measures to teachers who draw attention to conditions in schools that merit our attention. We would never have had this conversation at a national level about conditions, learning conditions, students' learning conditions in Detroit public schools if it hadn't been for teachers who were frankly quite brave who said, you know, we have seen the irreparable harm in Flint that was done to those children. And we see something similar happening here in Detroit. And we are going to get the attention of the nation, which is focused on Michigan right now. That is exactly the behavior that this legislation wants to prevent, is the act that has made us aware as a nation of the dismal conditions that have existed in Detroit public schools. So for both of these reasons, I want to say that there are technical and legal reasons why we think a court would very likely grant an injunction against this legislation. And we want the state board to stand with Detroit students and families and say, no, we will not take non-certified teachers for our district while other districts have certified teachers. We know the financial pressures that could lead a board to do something like that, especially in Detroit and other predominantly uh, communities of color. And also to say, no, we want to celebrate teachers' consciences. They are the ones with the eyes in the classroom. They are the ones who see the rats and the rodents and the mold and the 50 kids. They're the ones who are, their blood and tears every day in the classroom with those students. And so we don't want to silence them. We want to celebrate them. They're heroes. So please consider joining us. It would mean a lot for the state board to say it was joining with the children who are the plaintiffs in this case, in the injunction, to, to stop this legislation. There is an alternative. Um, Rosemary Robinson has introduced alternative legislation. Do we know the bill number? Uh, 5718, I believe. Which is a bill that is truly education friendly, that values the educational profession, the work of teachers, that values schools for children, that values children 
in places like Detroit as much as everywhere else. There is an alternative. Um, I think that it deserves your attention. So there is a course of action that can be taken, which will be the right thing for Detroit schools. You're at, we are at a moment right now where a lot is at stake, and you can really make a difference by asserting your voice. Thank you. One, uh, one quick thing uh, to the uh, uncertified teachers. The, under this legislation, they'll, be, they'll have not only elected board, but you'll have a financial review commission, which could easily put pressure on the school board to take certain action um, to, to be, uh, become fiscally responsible from their perspective. And those members are essentially appointed by uh, the governor. And so um, it's not just the school board's option. It's not just an option. You have, an, they have additional uh, pressure. So you've got this pincher uh, effect occurring. Now we'll entertain questions. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Questions from the board? Rick? Um, I'd like to commend all three of you for being here today. And I was able to go to the, um, the meeting uh, a couple weeks ago, Lamar, where you and the Detroit board were presenting um, and asking questions of Judge Rhodes and Alicia Merriweather. And I have to say that I was really heartened by the fact that both sides are talking to each other at the very least and you're beginning to um, engage in these questions so that people are talking the same language and are aware of, of the needs and of the concerns. Um, one thing that I, I've been speaking about as Michigan Teacher of the Year is the critical importance of um, embracing equitable access to excellent educators. And it's of particularly importance in urban areas. We all know there's a tremendous amount of teacher turnover that um, must be addressed. It's, it's absolutely impossible for effective teaching and learning to happen if, if teachers are not retained in buildings, if there's constant churn. Um, one thing I've been advocating for uh, both with the Senate Education <coughs> Committee, the House Education Committee, and with the Governor's Office is the need to <coughs> elevate the profile of National Board um, Certified Teachers and how Detroit Public Schools continues to have more National Board Certified Teachers than any, any other district in the state of Michigan. Um, and that that approach um, can not only um, help bring together the evaluation system with the certification system and, and the ongoing professional learning that teachers need to have, but it can also hopefully elevate the standing of professional educators so that there, there, there's this whole question of um, the professionalization of teachers. And yeah. part of the professionalization of teachers has to do with compensation, yes, but part of it has to do with appropriate recognition and stability. That's right. And if there's one thing that DPS, of course, needs is some stable, sustainable uh, professional presence. And so I'm hopeful that um, the Michigan network of National Board Certified Teachers, of which there are Detroit public school teachers um, who are members, that we can continue to be a part of this ongoing conversation because, because it resonates deeply with me as a classroom teacher and someone who understands and appreciates the critical role that teachers play. Um, there's a way that, that, that accountability can occur, which is what a lot of policymakers want. They want to know their money is well spent. They want to know that there will be good financial stewardship <coughs> at all levels. And there has to be a way that classroom teachers can be empowered so that, so that DPS schools can, can, can be stable. I met with people at the Detroit um, uh, Collegiate Academy at Northwestern just last week. And no one works harder than teachers in urban Thank areas you. in the state of Michigan. Thank you. Nobody works harder. No one faces more obstacles. Um, I ask every time I go to schools, every um, school I've ever been to, whether it's out in Newberry in the middle of, of, of rural UP or whether it's in the middle of the city or in the suburbs, I always ask, what do you love about your school and what do you find challenging about your school? And there was a young girl at, at the Detroit Collegiate Academy who said, there's teachers in my building who um, who bring food to kids who don't have enough food. They, they buy clothes for kids that don't have clothes to wear. Um, and and they, they really care about us. They take care of us in ways that, um, you know, a number of other educators can only f can't even fathom. Um, the, the work that occurs by educators in, in DPS is, is yeoman-like. And so anything that, that we could do to support that work on an indip individual level in, in the buildings and systemically is something that I, I hope um, can occur. And I know that, um, you know, keeping good teachers in the highest need um, districts and the highest need schools is of critical importance to sustaining good public education in Detroit and in urban areas throughout Michigan. So, again, thanks for coming. I applaud you for your work. Keep it up. 
um, and keep up your presence and, and keep up the pressure and I will do everything I can going forward to, to elevate the conversation as well. So thank, thank you. you. John? Um, thanks for coming. And mm -hmm. I agree with you absolutely that this legislation that's passed is not the best um, solution to the real learning challenges for Detroit school children, you know, absent um, a mechanism to constrain the proliferation of poor quality charters. Not all are poor quality, but you know, that's the thing that was not agreed to was some way to provide quality control over all public schools, charter and non. Uh, and uh, it certainly you know, may uh, accelerate, well, it may not lead to a long-term sustainable financial solution for DPS. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I thought we had a real good alternative, which I know you all did not support, that included the Detroit Education Commission in the Senate bill that would have provided the kind of quality control of all public schools and uh, help with the sex accessibility in neighborhoods for same. Um, I wish we had all been able to rally around that. It still may not have passed because, as you know, the House version, um, it, well, not only does it not fix the unconstrained charter problem, it, it has the punitive stuff about teachers, which is just gratuitous um, and wrong. Yeah. Uh, and, but uh, we were talking I, at lunch, I was suggesting to Craig, I wish the governor had vetoed uh, the <coughs> bill and uh, used his influence uh, and held out for the Senate version, which he originally supported. Craig was suggesting the House would have never gone for that and we would have bankruptcy. So I think there's the real question is if, if legislation is stopped or does not continue on, is the is bankruptcy the result and is that even a worse result for the the people and school children of Detroit because it would continue to perpetuate just a chaos of education uh, at more cost to the taxpayer. You know, I like you would like to see some way we could deliver the quality solution when 60% of kids don't go to DPS, uh, we need to be worried about all of the school children of Detroit getting a quality education. But uh, what happens if legislation does not continue as flawed as it is? Right. Well, so, I, if you don't mind, I'll go just ahead. go real quick. Now. I yield to you. Um, John, you know, my role is to bring forward um, research and to share with you the knowledge base that we have in education about what works, what sort of works, what doesn't work, right? Very briefly, the idea of a Detroit Education Commission has been tried in a number of other cities. And one thing that we do as people who celebrate knowledge is we look at the experience in other cities. We look at what the research says. And the idea of an educational commission of this sort has been tried in many places, including Newark and also in uh, New Orleans. And it has produced massive failures. And one thing that we do is we learn from those failures. We don't endorse an idea simply because Skillman and its network believe that it's a good idea from their experience in other cities. We actually look at evidence, we study the problem, and we also think about the ways in which a DEC would constrain a school board, which the, it would have in SB 710, uh, would constrain a school board's actions. Because what I did, John, is, um, I actually went and talked to a number of board members from other districts outside Detroit, and I said, what would it be like for you to be under the constraints of the DEC? And I laid that out. And they said, look, we are facing a hard enough time already financially. We are in dire financial straits. To have even less control over delivering quality schooling to our students would have a devastating impact. We're hardly able to do so now. But having our hands tied in terms of needing to get approvals elsewhere for opening schools and to have a body that frankly uses measures to evaluate schools that has no basis in research is harming kids. It's not helping kids. And frankly, the original version of SB 710 didn't pass because people lobbied for the DEC to be put into it. The original version did not have a DEC. And because the DEC was put into it, it became highly contested and was not supported. Um, so I look forward to the same um, passion that was put by Skillman and Excellent Schools Detroit, perhaps yourself and others, into advocating for a DEC 
as a measure that research has shown doesn't work to also now committing to opposing things that really research substantiates do not work, like non-certified teachers. These are the real issues. What think to, we, we value education. Look to educational researchers, not to large foundations that are at a national level working in partnership with the Walton Foundation and the Broad Foundation and the Gates Foundation. Value knowledge. That's why we're here at the State Board is we actually value knowledge. And we don't just go with something because Dan Verner says it, it's good, right? Um, Let me respond. Could, uh, can I just follow up? Um, you know, we you didn't quite answer my question. I mean, I respectfully disagree uh, with the notion. I totally agree, teacher, non-certified, punitive stuff on teachers is wrong and counterproductive to kids' learning, uh, and, and, and that's not good and, and should yes. not have been part of this bill. Um, when we de facto in Detroit, and actually other communities, we have a marketplace of public schools, and more children go to non traditional public schools than they do the traditional public schools. We have to find some way to manage for quality to make right. sure all those kids get a great education and have an accessible school, yes. that marketplace. And uh, you know, so opposing the DEC is one thing, um, but you didn't quite answer my question. Now we're where we oh, are. Sure. What happens if this legislation, you're asking us to help stop the legislation right. going forward. Then what happens? Okay, let, let me respond to that. First of all, your, your premise that the uh, bankruptcy is bad it's bad for every, everybody except for Detroit because the bankruptcy would expose what has happened, force the state to pay far more than that. The reason the Republicans or that, uh, that segment, and what I was saying, supported uh, the legislation to put those hundred millions, they knew and they even said for the record, and you can check the, uh, the journals, said for the record that they, the bankruptcy would, a uh, federal judge would impose far greater penalty and, and, and far greater uh, uh, um, expense on the state because of that. So that's, they don't, they don't want to give any money to Detroit. But in, in face with someone who's going to come up and look objectively what has occurred, then the state, all the, the citizens of the state of Michigan would have to pay for what was, in essence, a state-operated school district. Remember, we don't we refer to it as DPS. And at the last meeting, I said it's not at DPS. It's Snyder's operated schools in Detroit. <laughs> and that's why, and, and, and that goes to the competitive market because there is no competitive market in Detroit. The Snyder's operated schools in Detroit versus Snyder's controlled charter schools versus the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the suburban districts, which are losing population and are desperate for students, so have changed their policies, which historically have been racially based and kept African Americans out, but, but faced with the ability of being insolvent themselves, they've begun to let African Americans go in. So these educational refugees are fleeing Detroit because of all these things that the state has done. There is no competitive market because there is no DPE, DPS, there is no locally operated public school in Detroit, period. And, the, and when they go to the suburban schools, they are, again, disenfranchised because they didn't elect those board members. They can't remove those board members when there's a conflict between a GPS student and a, a parent who is a, uh, uh, who's a tax-paying student in that district. What do you think happens? What do you think? How do you think the scale is, is weighed? So it's not a competitive market, so you miss, uh, you're, you're misinformed there. Then the, the second thing uh, as to um, the... Uh, uh, well, I'll leave Steve right there because let other people talk. Sure. All right, Cassandra, please. So I just want to, based on what you just said, I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm clear. Are you saying that you would prefer bankruptcy? As oh, most definitely. You would? Yes. And all Detroiters would prefer bankruptcy. We get it before objective. What happens if you go, like, my original question before you, you <laughs> mentioned that was, okay, let's say you take this to court and you win an injunction. This year, you didn't have enough money to pay your teachers through the end of the year. What happens next year? My, my question is, okay, so you get bankruptcy. What happens? What does that look like in your mind? Okay, let me, bankruptcy looks over the federal judge who would automatically mandate that those students, it wouldn't, wouldn't be the second. He would mandate the resources at the state. He would mandate the state take its responsibility. What you have is the state operating the district and imposing, and which are Headley violations, imposing their failures academically and financially on the locals. They failed academically. That's why our students what, need the SRO. They didn't need all this, this remediation when, in 1999. 
They needed, when we had $40 million uh, rainy day fund, $114 million surplus, and we scored in the middle of the, of the state, they needed now after state of the years of state intervention and state experimentation on the little brown and, and black children of the city of Detroit. And, 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 and this, is, this legislation is continued. It's the continuation of that process because now they're going to experiment with, with the uncertified teachers, with less money, with a, a, a school board restricted. And the DEC would have restricted us even more and became even more political, politicized. If, if, if it's good, let's make it an MEC. And as a matter of fact, from our perspective and our reading of the Constitution, that's your job. You should be saying how many charters. You should be managing the marketplace throughout the state. Because even with a DEC, uh, as you pointed out, 30,000 of our students go to the suburban schools. The DEC has no, no authority over the schools of, of the surrounding district, but an MEC would. We support an MEC. We support the, the um, a management of the, uh, managing of the marketplace, which, and, and, I, and I'll be very blunt, which uh, to me, you are derelict in your responsibility into asserting, asserting yourself in, that, in the process and have allowed the legislature to bully this body. And they, first they came for me, but they're coming for, they're coming for you and they do everything they can to disempower this body. And you guys don't stand up from my perspective. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings. All right, we did set aside a half hour uh, and we do have other people waiting. Michelle? You, you speak for me in a lot of ways. I, I'm, um, for people who don't know, I'm a, I am a Detroit resident. I've raised, uh, parented 18 children in the city, black, brown, white. And I think all of them are important, regardless of race. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but I, I guess speaking a couple of things. Um, one is the role of this body. And I think I would ask you to have a conversation with Kathy Strauss, who did sue the governor over these issues and lost in the Supreme Court. So I don't think it's, um, I think there's, there's um, more than just reading of the Constitution that informs what we can and cannot do. And I, I guess for me, um, I, as I told the, the group over lunch, I have three kids in public school right now, and I'm looking to take them out. And I'm not putting them in a charter. I'm, I'm looking to send them to a private school because, because it's, it's, uh, it's just incredibly chaotic. I feel like this legislation was a kick in the teeth to parents of Detroit, all of us, that there was, our representatives were ignored, um, especially in the House. And, and so we have this mess. But I also have criticisms for organizations who are striving to get something for our kids. And that is that we are in disarray. And as, a, as somebody who is an organizer in my life, I might not be the education researcher, I can say that there needs to be um, more consensus and compromise on our side to reach something that's really going to have an impact mm -hmm. because we can have lawsuits and we can have, and I understand and I support the lawsuit and I, there's some other ones I'm hearing about that also sound very interesting, but at the end of the day I'm taking my kids out and y'all can, everybody can fight and, and I could see my neighbors leave, walk away from their house to move to another city and just leave their house behind because of schools. Yeah, destroy yeah. cities, and, absolutely. But there is no building of consensus of a, I mean, I think there was an attempt with the coalition, which I know is hated because it involves some, involves some people that there's disagreements with, but at some point there has to be, we have to sit down with people we might not like 100%. We might even think that they're, but we have to have a conversation to build some consensus and be strong in ourselves about what's right for the kids. Because if we're splintering and as a, and I'm just saying, as a parent, what's driving me out is that there is no vision and consensus. It's just lawsuits and shoving things down our throats. And I, I, I guess that's all I have to say. I, I, I to that consensus, very quite briefly, the consensus should be what every other school. We just want what Livonia, they have in Livonia, what they have in Grosse Pointe, what they have in Bloomfield. 
a, elect your school board, you appoint a superintendent. It was working before. The, when they, the rationale that for the original takeover is that the size of the district, that we had 20, 20 to 25 percent of our students were failing, which was not uncommon throughout the state. But because of our size, 25 percent of our students was twice as big as any other school district in total. And so the rationale was to take it over for that. But we proved, but we showed it, and it shows in the PowerPoint when you read it, because I was a legislator at the time, and I said, okay, you work, work your pedagogical magic, but we'll be le le the elected board stay over the bond money. And that, that, so I said, wait a minute. Let's say if, if you're only concerned with the pedagogical before the, for, for the quarter of the students, and so and because of the, the numbers, which is 48,000 failing students in Detroit. So we're not saying it was a perfect district, but it was, our district was so much larger that 25% uh, uh, represented a lot more than uh, anyone else. So if that's true, then here's, a, here's an amendment to it, that, and you can work your pedagogical magic. And then we'll, we'll just control our finances. We know the district was taken over for the money. The, our ability to successfully get our voters and parents to vote for greater uh, quality education and others not. And contractors and special interests came in so they could uh, plunder the district, period. I agree with that. But I, I would say that the one thing, if I, sorry, the, the, the no school district in the state has control over the way charters are operated in the state. Canton is having problems, Brighton is having problems, other communities, they don't come to the school board and say, we want to locate here. You know, and if the school board, like in Saginaw, tries to assert something over the buildings they own, they get their hands slapped, right? So, because, so it's, I think the DEC, although I understand the criticisms of it, I, I, un, I think because we have this influx, 80% for-profit, we have more for-profit charters, they're all located in Detroit for a variety of reasons, I, as a parent, did want to see some control, and even though it was the the mayor, and we have different opinions, I'm I don't com you know I. Anyway, I know you you have a, a more distrust than I do with that, but um, I think it was at least a hope, and I don't know exactly how they implemented it, and I don't know if they had eighty percent of the for-profit charters were you know in New Orleans, but I know what we have now. Is making me pull my kids right. out. Okay, the EAA, I'm, 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 real quickly, the EAA, the officer right. and treasurer of the EAA is the same person who was the mayor. So we, we, the, there, that explains why we would oppose it. He, the EAA, and if you think that was a good deal, then uh, by, by, uh, by all means allow the mayor to get his DEC. But if you think the EAA was, was, was bad, the mayor was the officer, and he resigned only because he didn't want education brought into the mayor's race. That's all, these are quotes. Right. But now he's bringing education into the mayor's office. Can I just make my comment, too? No. So um, I think that, Michelle, the best way that anyone who is interested in educational issues would proceed is if the issue is that there are charters and they're unregulated and they're poor charters, what one does is one looks to find out what are potential solutions for reining in charters. There's a lot of information available on how to do that. Um, uh, what has been done instead is that one solution that has been tried and failed in other cities was taken as a almost a, a, zeal, a, a sort of zealotry of faith in it, right? And there was no effort done to have a conversation about saying, well, what does the research base actually say about how we respond to a context like this? Is Detroit unique in some ways? Of course it is, right? But there is, there is a knowledge base to talk about how do you do that. And, and my answer to be, you know, because we don't have time, is, is just to say something like, you know what, um, the way to make uh, the situation better is not to further compromise the powers of an elected board that has been out of power for 20 years, what, which, which actually made the charters seem very competitive. They were competitive because DPS was mismanaged so poorly, right? So, so what we could have had is a discussion that says, you know, to some degree, if Detroit could actually for once, again, control its own destiny, like so many other districts with the school board, then we would have a situation 
where rather than so much per pupil, you know, and if the debt was paid off, rather than so much per pupil going to pay off a debt that was created almost exclusively during state control, then what we could do is we could actually say it's a new day at DPS. We now have more monies than we did before that are no longer going to this debt service. We have new energy. We have new vitality returning to Detroit through the mayor and the city council. And we're beginning to see the same thing in Detroit public schools, where, um, where a board that has control over its own destiny may not be able to compete effectively against some of the best charters, but we don't necessarily want, we don't want to necessarily shut them down anyway. But would it create an energy where it would start to draw people from some of the more poorly performing charters, especially in an era in which so much good reporting has been done on some of those failures and the word is sort of getting around? Yes, I think we would have seen a gradual movement to uh, DPS um, with the idea that it's a new day, just like it is in the city, and that that creates the beginnings of an upswell. Um, constraining the, 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 uh, uh, the board and its ability to be accountable to the voters is certainly not the way to go. And I guess the last thing that I want to say is just, um, I would encourage John and any others who lobbied so much for a DEC to show that you value as state board members qualified teachers at least as much as you value the DEC, right? We so did, do, we you did value, oppose that legislation, do you, so do you, you know value that. qualified teachers, which there is a huge research base for, as much as you value a DEC, which is there is not a, a research right. base? I just want to be very clear. We did lobby against uh, the uncertified teachers, so be very clear. I want to thank you for being here. I know that uh, good public policy debate is important and having these issues discussed is important, so we thank you for being here and sharing that. I just want to clarify one thing. It was referred to several times as Governor Snyder Schools. I want to be very clear that this also happened under Democratic governors as Absolutely. well. So we, we got to be very careful when we have public policy debate Emergency managers were also done, and takeover of the schools was also it's done under correct. both parties. It's incorrect, sir. No, it it's is not incorrect. It, no, it was Thank emergency you. financial manager, which is the PowerPoint demonstrates, which is, was limited to financial issues, and the board sued and won because the Okay. Emergency financial, hey, Mr. Lamar, thank Jennifer you for your comments. Thank you, Lamar. Manager. Thank you, Lamar, okay. for your comments. Appreciate it. Okay. PA Appreciate 72 guys being is very different. It's, it's in the PowerPoint. Thank you. All right, thank do we have the uh, new employees? All right, do we have an introduction of new employees? Kyle, we'll start with you, please. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we have uh, two new employees. I think they sat in the, in the back. We'll throw with the uh, library machine. Uh, Catherine Lancaster. Um, can you just tell a little bit about your role here in the department? Yes, I am the Youth Services Coordinator for the Library of Michigan Statewide Library Services. I'll be um, organizing the Michigan Reads, one book, one, one children's book, one state, as well as summer reading club programs, uh, continuing education for youth librarians, and hopefully uh, some new things to come. We also have John Krabuski, who's a student assistant, also with the library of Michigan. Well, it's nice to meet you. Uh, yeah, I like to set up as a student assistant. Uh, I just help out with federal documents. Thank you. And Susan, you have a new employee? Yep. I'd like to introduce Marsha O'Brien for special ed. Please talk about your position and what you're going to do at the department. I'm in the Office of Special Education and um, Program Accountability, and my role is state complaint coordinator. Well, congratulations and welcome to the department. We now move to public participation in the state board meeting. Marilyn, are there any individuals who wish to address the board at today's meeting? There are, and I believe I have all the forms, but if you happen to have one, if you would get that up to me, that would be awesome. The first group of presenters, I understand, is a group um, coming with Andrew Steinman. So if Andrew and his group could come and then he could make the introductions, that would be great. And looks like a group of five, so we've probably got enough chairs for you there. And if you want to just shut that computer, okay. if it's in your way, that's great. Um, each speaker, well, I don't know here. You've got a group. How, what? How much time? Nine minutes. Great. Eight, nine minutes. Thank you. Okay. 
for the group you get a little extra time um, because there's five of you all right please introduce yourselves and go ahead uh, my name is Marcus DJ I'm the algebra 2 facilitator at Kent Innovation High my name is Emily Ryder I'm a 2016 graduate of Kent Innovation High um, my name is Kaylin Dinn. I am going to be a junior at Kent Innovation High. Uh, I'm Amber Guzman, and I'm going to be a senior. And I'm Andrew Steinman, Educational Technology Consultant for Kent ISD. Okay, so to start, like I said, my name is Emily Ryder. I graduated this past spring from Kent Innovation High and also Northview Public Schools. So um, as an attendee of Kent Innovation High, we've kind of seen how project-based learning has affected my learning style. So to start, Kent Innovation High is on the campus of the Kent ISD. It's based on a model um, from New Tech Network based in Napa, California. So it kind of not only um, integrates the content set by the state, but also focuses on the soft skills or the real world skills that um, a lot of businesses are looking for. So with that, um, as I was going to be a senior, I chose to participate in an internship as a part of my curriculum and as a part of that real world learning. Um, so with the internship program through Kent Innovation, any student who's a senior who um, has completed all the required courses thus far has the ability um, to participate in an internship which fits either a career they're looking for or um, a hobby or an interest they have. Personally, I chose to work at the um, Educational Service Center through the ISD with um, the math consultant primarily but also the educational technology and the science consultants. Um, through that, we were able to, me and another intern, we were able to create um, different resources that we use throughout the county on the math sides of things, but also we worked alongside Andrew to um, work on our conference held at Kent Innovation. It's called Nova Now. So Nova Now is based on the Educon model where it's more conversational as opposed to um, sit and get. But then also with Nova Now, which makes it unique, is it's held in the school during the day while students are attending. Um, students have the ability, you know, to conversate with um, directly with teachers. And then Ms. Um, Ramos Martini came as well. And then so through that, we were able to come here today and present. But as um, my role at Kent Innovation, as I've seen both the business end of things and the education end of things. Um, my preparation for college, I think, compared to some who um, went through high school in more of a sit and get style or a lecture style, I feel that I've got the personal skills, but also the um, motivation and drive as I move into college in the upcoming fall. So I think that Kent Innovation and this similar model should be used more so throughout the state in order to prepare um, students for their best um, for their next steps upcoming, either whether that be business or into college or into other real world situations. Yeah, so, um, hi. So completely like agreeing with Emmy, you know, Ken Innovation High really um, gives, of, gives us many opportunities and is very much a college and career ready school. And it's both that helped me grow um, academically as well as personally. So like um, every project that we come across, we're placed into groups and these groups help us like um, obtain like leadership skills such as like motivation, communication, how, building relationships, just trust, responsibility, respect. And um, you know, it helps us now and as we go into our future. And so, um, so, um, <laughs> so we grow with one another. And so our school, it's, it's pretty small because like there's many different schools that come to our school, like from like the county. And so we learn how to work with one another and you know, we learn how to work with many different personalities and ideas because every school is different. So, and that helps us grow as well because like we're not used to it and it shows us like, okay, like how different it is. And even the ideas that we take from Ken Innovation, like I bring them to my home school and like they love it because Ken Innovation High is a very different, it has a very different environment. And we grow like as a family, you know, it's like a really family feel. And, you know, we're just um, blessed with many opportunities to grow at this age and like the grade that we're in that will benefit us in the future as well. Um, like Amber said, um, KH, we do a lot of projects. And so that's the way we learn. <clears throat> we do projects and we do projects back to back. Um, every time 
you do a project, there's always a goal to it. And so an example would be in my physics class, we had to build a robot. And your goal was to make it go through a maze and learn about electricity and circuitry while you're doing it. So each project has different goals. One would be um, in English class, you would have a debate, and your goal was to win a tournament against your opponents. And so some goals are more important than others. Um, like when you're trying to improve the environment around you or trying to help people in need, one of my favorite projects was when I was a freshman in global studies. We learned about modernization, I mean, yeah, modernization and countries that weren't modernized with technology. And so people who were struggling to live in child labor was really big in other countries and they couldn't get an education like us in the United States. And so this project, we helped people in Somalia, Africa, who, which was not a modernized country. And so the project was we started off with $10 and we could do whatever we want with these $10. But our goal was to make it well, to increase the amount of money that we had. And so some groups bought baking materials and made cookies and sold those cookies. Some groups bought beads and strings and sold jewelry. Um, my group, we bought yarn and then sold scarves. After a certain amount of weeks of building these materials and then selling it, um, we had to turn the money in to our teachers and to decide who we were going to give the money to. We went along the lines of give a man a fish and he'll be fed for the day, teach him how to fish, and he'll be fed for life. And so we gave the money to people who wanted to start their own business. And so we learned about microfinancing and we did end up succeeding in helping someone create their little business that would support their family. And overall, I love this project because not only did we help someone in need, but we also learned about cool things like the Industrial Revolution and how things changed from the past, like child labor and things like that. Um, overall, at my years of KIH, it had provided me like opportunities to learn academics and the real world content like the project I just mentioned. Um, not only have they provided me these opportunities, but great experiences as well. So thank you for your time, and we hope that we inspired you to make a difference as well, and we are open for any questions. Does anybody have any questions? Correctly. I was also at NOM now, and I have to say that was one of the most profound um, experiences for me as a classroom teacher to see the extent to which project-based learning just energizes kids, engages them, motivates them, bridges the gap between theory and practice. They realize that what they're doing matters, that their learning um, is contextualized with real-world problems and solutions. So there's this tremendous empowerment. So I can't say enough about the role that project-based learning has in schools, and I, I applaud you for, for making that such a part of life at um, Ken Innovation High because it, it is truly inspiring work that you're doing and I see it in the in the projects that the kids um, do there um, it's truly transformational and that's the kind of teaching and learning we need to advocate for because that's what keeps kids wanting to go to school it, it's relevant it's meaningful they love it it's it's incredible so kudos to you guys okay. Okay. And, um, I, I'm crying because you have inspired us and you are going to inspire a lot of people in your in your careers whatever wherever you go so uh, i applaud the, the structures from in the leadership of kisd and in the in the school that you're attending i picky bag with with our teacher of the year rick and attended this uh school when you were presenting your projects and exactly this is the kind of education that we need to out the stadium. This is what we're advocating on our, on our board as we move on to be a top 10 in 10 years. So thank you so much for coming. You were awesome. You presented very well. You are on your way. Kathleen? <laughs> I'd like to second what Lupe just said. I've heard presentations on project learning a number of times but it's much more effective when it's the students who are doing the presenting and talking about your own experiences. So that's very encouraging and very uh, rewarding. I agree with, with Lupe that you're gonna do fine. Uh, we should be pushing this, but we will be pushing this, uh, this approach uh, much more. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rahelio Landin, and that's to be followed by Linda Cypert Kilburn. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Rahelio Landin, 
Performance Ed, Superintendent, President, Board Members. Thank you for uh, this opportunity to come before you. I didn't know if we were doing three or five today, so I might shortchange you a little bit. Um, educational equity underscores the work of the U.S. Department of Education, as it should, in my opinion, the work of every board in the country, in every department. Title I rulemaking negotiations ended with, ended with no consensus on the supplement, not supplant provision in ESSA. As a nominated rulemaking committee member, I encourage the board to lead in shaping policy to enforce this provision as it relates to implementation in Michigan. Two weeks ago, the condition of education report was released. Time does not permit. I'm going to run down a few things uh, that should be considered. I'm sure you're aware of many, if not most, or all of them. Uh, but as well, I'll get to the point in terms of their pertinence this afternoon. The Alliance released ensuring equity, the role of NSIs and subgroup accountability. I was pleased to hear the superintendent earlier commit to exceeding uh, all goals and objectives regarding accountability under ESSA. Michigan's num N number is 30. Our student teacher ratio is 23 to 1, which means the only accountability reporting for subgroups will be for classrooms with more than 30 students. Uh, I think that's something that uh, Michigan can certainly do better on. I offer Florida as a model of one of the 10 states, I believe, that uses an N number of 10 or less. Uh, and that may be the reason they are experiencing what they're doing in terms of accountability. Last week, the U.S. Department of Education Office of Civil Rights released their civil rights data collection, an interesting read for everybody on the issue of disparities and equity. Every Student, Every Day Initiative, Chronic Absenteeism Conference uh, basically put a fine point on the need for more supportive services. Uh, and I'll get to another specific subgroup population in a moment. Uh, we all have heard about the Michigan Legislature's DPS bill package and what that does and does not provide for. There's been much conversation here just, just now about that. Just yesterday, Grad Nation released their homeless student report, again, putting a fine point on the impacts of poverty. Students experiencing homelessness were 87% more likely than stably housed students to drop out. 54% say emotional supports are equally important as concrete supports, housing, food, transportation. What's very or fairly important, 86% said having someone to talk to or check in with for emotional support. Student homelessness has intensified. Liaisons say resources have not kept up. They cite key challenges, including lack of funding, 78%. First recommendation, work to ensure that the ESSA amendments on identifying and serving homeless students in the McKinney-Vento Act and Title I Part A are fully implemented in states, schools, and districts. What is my point? The nation is screaming for a solution. 18 months ago, I presented one. 18 months later, according to the superintendent and the president earlier, the budget is essentially flat. You don't have any more than you did then. In fact, relatively speaking, you have less as more is expected of you under ESSA. There is a way to engage these issues. I encourage you to revisit the performance ed solution, resource equity, as it relates to all of this and everything else that has been brought to your attention these past 18 months. We will be uh, promoting it as a school in a tech pack. Uh, I did not have, I'd like to spend these last seconds reviewing or, or discussing a little bit about the report that was shared today. And let me commend you, Superintendent, on the 10 and 10. Two things that were mentioned that are just in the first couple of pages, sustainability and personalized learning. Uh, it's a commitment that the Zuckerberg Initiative uh, has committed to nationally. Uh, we all know who Mark Zuckerberg and Chan Zuckerberg are. It, it's a huge shot in the arm to promote personalized learning. Our solution speaks directly to it. Uh, in all of that, as far as I can see, the most important thing in this report is this picture right here. And I would just say our solution addresses effective, efficient, equitable, sustainable, and scalable with the final goal of improved student outcomes. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, 
again, let, let's continue to dialogue and, and see what we can do on the value side. Thank you. Thank you. I believe our final speaker of the day is Linda Cypret Kilborn. My name is Southern Thunder Woman, a.k.a. Linda L. Seifert Kilburn. I'm from Marshall, Michigan. I've been reading how it is time to move Michigan education forward along with pressing educational issues. And I'm here today to say I hope this will include the Native American nickname, mascot, and logo issue here in Michigan. Improving learning for all children also includes the subject to protect our children against racist imagery and to stop racism in our public school systems. How? By working together and addressing the Native American mascot issue here in Michigan and by improving education by teaching true Native American history in our classrooms. Our school systems have failed us and our children are not by teaching the truth about Anishinaabe people. It is our spirituality that you offend by using Native American Anishinaabe imagery, by using our sacred items, our sacred face paint, and our sacred spiritual images of our spiritual leaders. First, I would like to ask the State Board of Education here today to send out a new mem memorandum. I believe the last memorandum was sent out on July 11th of 2006. And it's been 10 long years now. I have been addressing the state school board for a long time, and there have been many turnovers throughout Michigan for superintendents, principals, school boards, and teachers' positions. School employees need to be reminded and informed of the resolution that was passed on June 26 of 2003. As school boards prepare for the new school year coming up, it would be a good time to remind them that many Native American tribes and organizations find the use of Native American mascots, nicknames, and logos within our public schools to be deeply offensive. offensive. Many tribes here in Michigan have written resolutions against the use of Native American imagery, even in the United Tribes of Michigan. It is our sac sacred spiritual culture that has been offended. It is our way of life that is belitted by using these institutional racist names and logos. And here are some actual pictures that were taken at Clinton and Pawpaw schools that do exactly that. And um, this one right here, this was at graduation. You can see the um, spiritual leader, which is this picture right here, that was actually painted on their gym floor. Um, and I talked to the artist about this, and it was to actually represent the chief going to heaven. We must each come to our own understanding of what a sacred spiritual culture is and assume responsibility for our own actions. There is no divine excuse that shelters us from the cause and effect from our relationships and our actions. Each of us has a personal feeling and understanding about what we deserve and should be allowed to have, about how we should conduct ourselves and how these things affect us. The change should be more than a single act of generosity, <coughs> courage, fortitude, and strength. We do have the power and the responsibility here today to make certain that our own actions do not further contribute to the demise of sacred spiritual culture of the Anishinaabe people. The Michigan Coalition Against Racism in Sports and Media, along with co-founder Jim Farrar, worked very hard getting the state blue ribbon program to accept a rule that no school using Native American imagery could apply for the award, only to have the program stopped with the reasoning and budget cuts. Was it really budget cuts an issue? Schools try to go over and under the radar and make changes that are truly eliminating the problems, not truly eliminating the problems, but instead do half-hearted changes like Okamas, who kept the nickname Chieftains and Chiefs, but removed the imagery. And then you have schools like Clinton, Michigan, and Illinois County, who use the most racist of all nicknames, the Redskins, and continue to use it even after they have been given educational material, school board presentations, <coughs> and then to have their former superintendent, David Prey, tell a Michigan civil rights representative 
who we invited at a special open school board meeting that you were not invited here in front of an entire gym full of people. How much more dis disrespectful can one get? But at the same time, they were telling us, we honor you. Also now here in 2016, we have Pawpaw Redskins along with four other schools, Belding, Camden Frontier, Sandusky, and Saranac using the race-based nickname Redskins, including Pawpaw and Clinton. We're capable of influencing, influence, influencing excuse me, others by our own actions in keeping the Anishinaabe cult culture sacred. Do you know we as Anishinaabe people have the highest su suicide rate among our teens than any other culture of people? We have the highest dropout rates in school. Why? Many reasons, but one, this one adds to the list because our children are made to feel belittled, ashamed, and ridiculed over who they are by being bullied at the same time. Racism comes in many forms. Institutionalized racism is what we have here strong today, and until we make the change of these nicknames and logos, we will be supporting institutional racism. Ask yourself, why? Why do people want to be Redskins or Braves? Why use Indian imagery? Because they want to be Indian Braves, to be something that they're not, or never can be? They can never be Indians. You must be born to be an Indian. They were not born Indians, so they can never be Indians. Never. We are a living, breathing culture of people. Mascots are not. We are not mascots. I'm not anyone's mascot. And my children and my grandchildren are not mascots. We are the only culture of people mentioned in the United States Constitution. We are a protected class of people. And the Michigan Constitution states that schools shall provide for the education of its pupils without discrimination as to religion, creed, race, color, and national origin, page 36, article 8, education, subsection 2, section 2. And that includes Anishinaabe students, or as you <coughs> would say, Native American students. We have many resolutions written today against the use of Native American Anishinaabe Indians imagery, including civil rights resolutions, both federal, state, NAACP, NCAA, along with many Native American or organizations and others. There are many research papers now done showing the effects of this is issue on children, Native and non-Native alike, and they are all saying how destructive these things are to our children. The change must come now, because through understanding comes peace and love and honor and respect for all human beings. What can the State Board of Education do? Move Michigan Public Schools forward. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Are there any items the Board wishes to have removed from the consent agenda prior to a vote? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Second. Second. Moved and supported. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Comment by state board members. Are there any additional comments by state board members? John? It's, um, it's not the only um, person who's recently encouraged us to maybe refresh our communication about our recommendations on Native policies. So it might be Thanks. timely for us to share again the formal resolution, the civil rights resolution, and encourage the districts. The, the, the resolution we did is very nice, well, appropriately worded, you know, about its effects and uh, to encourage them to take up the issue again. So maybe that's something we could talk about more at agenda planning or figure out how to do it. My colleagues would agree. Yes. And what is it we're going to discuss the request of the Detroit people? I have some qualms about it because they're, they're focusing on the provision for non-certified teachers, but that's not a requirement. They don't have to do it. They, have, they can decide to do it, they, but they don't, according to the way I read the legislation. That's correct. That's Just gives an option. I don't think that's a very strong that's argument. Is that their legal argument? I think they just did harm. Mm -hmm. I agree that the the teachers in Detroit should be the top-notch teachers. We've been saying that right along for the urban districts of hard to educate students. And this is not going to help that, but I don't, I, I'm not sure that their argument is very strong. 
Eileen, please. I, I think one of the things that's uh, confusing and about which I don't have enough information is that we do have chronic shortages in science. We have chronic shortages in some areas in math. We have it in foreign languages. The department's been trying to address that for 10 years. That's why we came up with an alternate, uh, alternative route to certification. And uh, I, I had the amazing opportunity to talk with Alicia Merriweather for quite a while um, uh, up at Mackinac. This is a woman who was chosen by the teachers. Uh, we have no way to know whether she'll be the permanent superintendent, but it's impossible for me to imagine that she would voluntarily hire a non-certified teacher. Uh, you know, she's, she is so lock ready, uh, aimed, and fiery at bringing children better education in Detroit. And missing from the, the aftermath of this legislation, which was extremely painful for so many people, is that voice. Um, uh, so it, we don't have a vision of the future that we're hearing. But I, I have, um, I, I didn't know her well enough to understand uh, who she was, and after those conversations, I'm really heartened by what can happen in Detroit based upon her vision. So fingers crossed. Okay. I also, oh, sorry. I guess for me, and I was ready to put forward a motion to look at, to explore joining the injunction or to explore um, entering an amicus brief. And so I guess it went beyond um, the teacher shortage. I definitely think that that's um, creating um, uh, uh, non-parity for, again, uh, another non-parity for, for Detroit schools. but. Also looking at the Headley Amendment that has continued to be brought up um, and, and the violation of that, I would like to also explore the two-thirds majority for each, the, each houses of government um, that they mentioned was required, and I've seen that um, written in other places. Um, there were some other things that, that, that were brought up. So I, I was um, looking to put, put forward a motion to explore um, and joining the injunction or to file a, an amicus brief. I don't know if anyone would support that. But. Yeah, I, I, I would very much not personally, I don't get a vote, but support that because we don't want Detroit schools in bankruptcy. It would cause a, a billions of dollars of issues. Plus, I think you just probably sealed the fate of Detroit schools. Once parents know that they uh, don't have the financial operations to run the school district, I think you just decimate the Detroit schools. I think every parent leaves to other options. I just think going to bankruptcy is not an answer that we should be supporting. And I would need to understand better the ramifications before I'd be comfortable pursuing that. So I guess I would, ex would put forward a motion to explore joining the injunction or filing an amicus brief. And if Michelle has supported the motion. Okay, that then it has been moved. That, that would seem to suggest that we're endorsing joining the This is to explore the, the idea. Yeah, it's it's just to get lawsuit. more information. So what, do we I, need a I motion would, for I that? would not support it unless it was made more clear that we want more information about okay. the impact potentially of any such bankruptcy. I like, you know, I was listening to Lamar and thinking could it be possible that a judge would take over and run the place better? But I think it, it would lead to the dissolution, I meaning the more likely course would be if that happened and it went through bankruptcy, it, it would be uh, chosen to dissolve DPS and open up a total market of charters as a replacement because we're two-thirds mm -hmm. of the way there right now. Um, and that would be my concern about the impact of a bankruptcy. I, I I thought what they were saying was that they want to, they want to file a suit for an, just file for an injunction to keep the bill from being implemented. Right. right, but they don't have money to run the school district. Right, because yeah. it's tied to the money. So they'd have to file bankruptcy because I don't see the legislature passing any more money. So I guess I would like to explore all of that. What would joining, what would be what would happen with the injunction or filing an amicus brief. I would like to explore so you're, the... you're saying is to explore the possibility of doing that, not necessarily to do it right away. Right. And I don't know how much time we have, but yes. We have to get more information. Mm -hmm. and, and, but my question would be, do we need an actual motion to do that? Can't we do it without, do it yeah. without a you motion? You could just direct me to Formal get motion. that information. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the point that both you and John bring up, like what you know, 
I don't know what a school board, a school district in bankruptcy. I don't would look like. I don't, I'm not quite sure anybody can speak with absolute certainty about what that's going to be because I don't think it's. Well, Judge Rhodes has spoken very clearly on that. <coughs> Yeah, he said it would be a mess. Really bad of it. If anybody knows, bankruptcy. Yeah, he does. Right. right. He says it would be a disaster. Mm -hmm. yeah. He supports we, the we, Detroit public schools. He wants them to succeed. Well, there's the emotional aspect of this and the legal aspect of this. The legal aspect is uh, there is uh, by a certain date, Detroit will be out of money. Uh, the school district will go into bankruptcy, and uh, there isn't enough capacity within the charter world, even with the really quality outside charter providers, to take care of the kids. Of, take care of the kids of Detroit. Um, the uh, bill would come due for all citizens in the state. Um, uh, it is to explore something that we don't understand the possibilities of legally, and go on board and give credibility to it. Without she's trying. This, I've been overruled. Sorry, I've been sorry, outspoken. Yeah, sorry, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm glad. What I was saying is that there's the legal aspects which are very well defined, and there's the emotional aspect of seeing a city in turmoil which can't resolve this yet. And I understand that clearly. But the legal, the legal ramifications of seeming to endorse an injunction or a lawsuit that would pr trigger bankruptcy is something that I personally cannot vote for. I, I understand people wanting to explore it informally. I hear that, but I, from what I've seen, the legal aspects are very well defined, <coughs> and we're about to. Uh, uh, the the, the uh, resolution that was reached was to make sure that things didn't go off the cliff. And I, I've n I've not read um, House Bill 5718 that they talked about, which Rosemary Robinson it sounds like she's introduced. I would like to know more about this two-thirds majority. It sounds like Detroit. Um, I would like to explore that. So, but the legislature has left; they're not reconvening. So, even if that bill is introduced, uh, you, it, it, this, this legislation will go into effect. Uh, so, that's uh, that's what I'm trying to say: is that there's real legal parameters here. This is not this is right. this is no one. We we don't have a legislature to come back into session to try and pass a new bill. We have a, a defined date. Of, I don't I don't remember what exactly what it is, but there is a date by which Detroit the DPS runs out of money. At which point bankruptcy is triggered. So this but, Pam, could we, um, given the presentation, given the request, we could uh, direct our superintendent to bring back information on the potential impact of joining any of, of a DPS bankruptcy or of an injunction. Not suggesting we're going to join it, but report back on the impact of an injunction and potential fallout from that, including bankruptcy. And, and I, give I us his assessment of what would happen. I also think that it's a legitimate question about the two third. If we could maybe reach out I to the attorney them. general's office mm -hmm. and find out. There were issues that they brought up, but yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm very unhappy with the legislation that passed. Right. All right. So we will do both of those things. And Brian, then will you also include the Detroit uh, Public School Board? in this because I would like to get more we've, we've just heard that presentation so I would like to get more of the information that they shared with us and and why <coughs> they filed the injunction or are filing the injunction well they gave us information that we have to review and so but I certainly will talk to Lamar thank you is there, is there anything in this current legislation that prohibits the incumbent school board members from running in the next election that was taken out. No, they could run. They can run. They can run. I think they can't hold two seats at the same time. No, of course not. They can be on the old co and the new Right. Correct. I'm guessing they're not going to want to be on the old co. They can resign from that board and run for the other one. And run for the other one. Okay. But when the first version was passed, it would be. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, there were so many versions. We're just directing our to get information. Now, once you've got the old co and the new co, mm -hmm. who cares if the old co goes bankrupt? Mm. Well, it has a designated amount of money already right. associated with it, right? Right. So it, it, that shouldn't be an issue. Well, I'm just thinking, um, A, if the old board continues and they don't support the settlement they refuse to pay, I don't think they really have they any They don't have power. any control over anything. Yeah, it's just, okay. a, it's just a, a, a hollow just district a, collecting some property person. taxes and using it to pay off the debt. Yeah. Okay. They have no other ability to influence anything. They don't run anything. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, 
And just to put this in perspective, um, you've got Detroit Public Schools, and, and I had four kids that went there. Two of my, two of my girls were uh, uh, high school graduates from DPS. Um, you still got the largest, uh, numerically speaking, uh, district in the state. You've got uh, about 37% of Detroit students, so the claims that DPS speaks for all Detroit parents uh, has to be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, but nevertheless, they have an economy of scale. They have debt paid down. Uh, they have, they're among the highest per pupil funded uh, in the state. Uh, and I think with the right leadership, uh, now they're going to be, come November, they're going to be accountable to local Detroit citizens. I am cautiously optimistic that they will find a mission uh, and continue. Uh, will they become what they were uh, in 1994? I doubt it, uh, but uh, I think they still have a mission as largest district in the state in serving some of our most uh, vulnerable students uh, in need, I, I, I'm, I'm as I say, cautiously optimistic that this does represent a new start, uh, opportunity to focus on uh, meeting constituent needs as opposed to, as opposed to counter dependence on, on government or outside agencies. Uh, and the change is kind of scary and, and there is some of that uncertainty that's been reflected here, but uh, I think we should not overlook uh, some of the. It's it's a shade of gray. It's not all it's not all one color or another. So I think we need to just keep that in perspective going forward. Um, a main concern of me around being able to control the charters is the just the inability or the unwillingness or whatever it is the structural reason for the charters especially the for-profit to really take the hardest to educate special ed students and so this has been shown this has come up there's a and and with that imbalance comes a structural deficit that's already built in and that's just one area of where with where there's not a control and oversight or or maybe we need to discuss given what we have you know what are some ways to and I don't, I mean, I feel like what power do we have but to, to look at the, what, what the, rea the political reality that we have. I, if I had a magic wand, I would have made us be, have the best practices of the whole country. But that, isn't, that wasn't going to happen. That just wasn't going to happen. That's not the way it was working. So given what we have, are there things that we can propose to sort of mitigate some of these problems? And one of those issues is around special ed. And so if we look at financing, I mean, part of the problem is, is that the state and the federal government don't fully um, fund special education. There's no incentive or there's to take care of those special ed kids who are, at least in Detroit, are really, we're how, <laughs> they're really in these uh, schools who can't find special ed teachers to teach them. So I think maybe what we as a body need to do is to look at, um, given that's what's here to do something good. I also think that merit pay for teachers and then the, the muzzling of teachers, and then I also completely disagree with the whole tenure reform that was passed, which I also think undermined why people don't want to be teachers anymore. But there's things that we can do to address. <coughs> I still think we should at least have an understanding, a better understanding about what would happen if, if, if these lawsuits do succeed mm -hmm. what and what and then what and so we should have a look at it if it, it, whether we join it or not we should understand what the what the what the road map what the road looks like ahead or possibly looks like ahead and I think it's worth investigating mm -hmm. Dr. Z I fully agree that we need to be apprised of any possibilities including you know what merit this law suit has uh, as far as Ed that's an area where I believe that uh, policies probably could be improved. Uh, we cannot make water run uphill, uh, but, but with the proper measures, you can keep it from flooding your basement. Uh, I think that's, that's our challenge, is to know the difference between what's not and how we can channel 
how we can use policy to channel or influence decisions and behaviors. So um, a uh, extra, I mean, one logical possibility would be to acknowledge that special education, at least certain classes of it, are much more expensive to deal with than others and, and to advocate a supplemental tuition grant for, uh, for these kinds of students that may even encourage some schools like, I think it's Eaton Academy, which specializes in certain kinds of special education, uh, and to diversify the school offerings and to have some schools take a particular interest in students classes of students that are more difficult than others, I think would be a good thing for the state and for families. So, um, to your point, um, we should be, and, and I certainly will want to be helpful. Um, there is a major powwow. I just got called from Rhodes on the 22nd, the governor, Brian, his team, all the stakeholders, trying Detroit moving forward. Um, what do we do to make this thing work as best as possible while none of us are happy with it? Um, within that, it would be a great venue to keep pressing for real value add on, okay, how do we do better with the special ed uh, challenges and what are we going to do about that? And if you have specific recommendations, um, if what Craig was suggesting, if they're around charter school, only accredited authorizers get to open schools in Detroit. We should be raising these. Is, can we get more teeth into that? And or are there other teeth we can put into who really gets to operate charter schools in Detroit um, and keep using the desire to move ahead constructively, to deal constructively if we can, but effectively with some of the things that have been causing the problems, you know, which I totally agree with you. The special ed right. differential is right. huge. huge. And we should keep calling it out and saying, okay, what are we doing about this, people? Right. Is the are the DP is there anyone from DPS board a part of this? I do not know. Okay. Or Michelle, a resident who is yeah. <laughs> and or. And or. <laughs> well, I also think you would yeah. hope I mean, it would make sense to have <coughs> someone from the DPS board. I mean, yeah. there's already starting to get some communication, and I know it would make things livelier. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I maybe an expert like Dr. Padroni. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's Mr. Rhodes' meeting, so we're not going to dictate who he invites to his meeting. So. All right. Uh, we do, uh, as a part of the consent agenda, I think uh, we approve Rochester College, but I think they left before I could introduce them. So we certainly <laughs> want to thank Rochester College for being here. We did approve them as part of the consent agenda. If there's any uh, other items that the board members would like to see on a future agenda, please let John, Cassandra, Michelle, or Marilyn know. There's no board meeting in July. We have a board meeting August 9th at 9.30, Wednesday, September 14th at 9.30, and Tuesday, October 11th at 9.30. It would be our intent to, at the August meeting uh, to bring uh, a revised uh, recommendation set of, of guidelines on the LGBT thing, and we'll be very clear on that so the public and the legislature knows if we're going to be doing that or not or if we've got enough time to get the work done. Adequacy so. study? Will it, will it, yes. so, that's due June 29th, 4th, June 24th, and so we'll see. All right, thank you. Thank you.